Good morning, friends, and welcome to the third session of our Wednesday in the Word Bible study through the book of Nehemiah. Obviously, today we are not in the fellowship hall. I am actually on vacation with my family, and so we are doing this pre-recorded ahead of time. So we're here in my office today for the third session. So if you're here with us in person in the fellowship hall, don't worry. It'll be the same 30-minute teaching as we have been doing. If you're joining us online, then really no difference for you, just a different background. So this is our third session on the book of Nehemiah. <clears throat> we are studying verse by verse through this amazing book. And our study is called Big Calling, Bigger God, Wisdom and Courage in Difficult Times. We are looking at the life of Nehemiah and how he overcame the tremendous calling that God gave him of rebuilding both the walls and the worship in Jerusalem, uh, really codifying God's people back together after they were dispersed uh, by Babylon. And we're seeing how in overcoming that, Nehemiah leaned into a bigger God for his big calling. It wasn't that Nehemiah was a great man, even though Nehemiah was a great man, but he overcame this big calling because he had a bigger God. And there are principles that we can pull out from his life that can help us in what God has called us to do each and every single day. We see his wisdom and we see his courage over and over again being the driving factors behind his success and what he was able to accomplish for God and for God's people. In our first session, we talked about the history in the background, and that is a critical piece of information in the book of Nehemiah, as we remember that at the point that the book of Nehemiah starts, there are no walls around Jerusalem. It has been completely ransacked. The temple has been built back in a fledgling state, but there is still no protection for God's people. There are a few groups of people that have gone back, one under Zerubbabel and one 12 years before Nehemiah starts with Ezra. And they are back there trying to scratch out an existence and trying to defend themselves uh, in this city that God has given them and yet is in complete and total ruin. In week two, we began to look through the first three verses of Nehemiah. We talked about many things, but one of the things that we kind of kept coming back to over and over again was God's faithfulness and how we can look back at how God has delivered and provided in the past and how that can help give us strength in our current situation. In fact, Nehemiah's very name means Yahweh has comforted. It reminds us to not just look at our situation, but to look back at how God has delivered, provided for, and comforted people throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, and throughout Christian history. Even those around us can be an encouragement for how God has delivered them. That's part of being gathered together in the church. We don't just lean on ourselves, but we look to those around us. Those that God has delivered through maybe similar circumstances or those that God delivered through something greater that we can lean into to figure out how God can deliver us through our current situation, no matter how dark or dire it may seem. Today we're gonna to pick up in verse four and we're gonna to begin to look at Nehemiah's prayer. In chapter 1, uh, we have kind of the introduction that we did in the first three verses last week. And then the remainder of Nehemiah chapter 1 is exclusively given over to the prayer that Nehemiah prays upon getting the bad news about Jerusalem. So remember last week in the first three verses, Nehemiah is safe and sound in the citadel at Susa, the capital. He is the cupbearer to the emperor. Artaxerxes and everything about his life is good and comfortable and safe. Yet he hears from a friend that Jerusalem is in trouble, that the walls are in ruin. Uh, and this is not in ruin from Babylon, even though they are still in ruin from Babylon, but in Ezra chapter four, which would have happened just a few years prior to the beginning of Nehemiah, there was an attempt made to rebuild some of the walls and that met with a disaster. Uh, it was falsely reported back to Artaxerxes that they were trying to rebel and, and build a defense to, to, to overthrow him. And so he went in and, and basically just wiped everything back out again. And that's the word that came to Nehemiah. Now, 
Nehemiah could have had any number of reactions, but let's read in verse 4 uh, what his reaction was. It says, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Now, the first thing to note here is that as soon as I heard, so note that we have switched here to the first person. And remember from our introduction that Nehemiah, though it was compiled most likely by Ezra, and it has contained in it uh, many other outside documents um, from the Persian libraries, there are several sections that are written in the first person, written by Nehemiah, probably in his own personal journals or his personal reports. Um, either are, but Ezra was able to get those, and Ezra being a historian was able to compile all those together. And so that's why we switch into the first person here. It says, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and I mourned for days. Nehemiah could have had any number of reactions to hearing this news, um, but his was one of concern for God's people and for God's work. But it didn't have to be. Realize that he could have reacted in many, many different ways. Uh, it could have been a reaction of indifference. Oh, you know, hey, at least it's not me. I'm safe here in the Citadel. It could have been a reaction of indignation. Well, they deserve what they're getting because they didn't listen to the laws and they didn't follow through. Uh, it could have been blame. He could have had a reaction of blame. Well, if Ezra had been a later leader, this wouldn't have happened. But rather, Nehemiah responded with a broken heart. He stopped and he wept and he prayed and he fasted. Our first application question for today is this. What was the last injustice that so broke your heart that you had to sit down and weep over it? We understand that God has given us tender hearts and a spirit that resonates with injustice. And when we see those things around us, we feel them and should feel them deeply. But we also understand that there are things that God has given us a more tender heart for. There are things that in our own spirit, um, we just Maybe it, it connects with something in our own past, or, or maybe it's as simple as something as it was a commercial that you saw over and over again as a kid that just always broke your heart. And so now homelessness is something that, that you have a sensitive spirit to. It's not important that all of our reactions are the same to every situation, but it is important that we each have a deeply emotional reaction to something. There should be some injustice that happens that drives you to mourn and weep over it. When you see children hurting, when you see families being torn apart, uh, when you see um, financial injustice happening, it could be any number of things. When you see churches being split, whatever it is for you, there should be something for you. There should be something that you connect with on a ministry level that when you see it happening, it should bring you to tears. It should break your heart um, as it did with Nehemiah. And that breaking of our heart is God's way of reminding us that these are his people too. And that these are people that are made in God's image. And we have a responsibility to bear one another up and to promote justice among all people. The next thing I want to see is that Nehemiah not only wept, but he stopped and he prayed and he fasted for days. In fact, we're going to see at the beginning of chapter 2 that after this prayer, that it is several months before Nehemiah goes before the king to ask permission. And so even though he specifically here stopped right at the beginning and wept and prayed and fasted for days, it was actually months of prayer uh, before he finally took action. And that's, I think that's a critical thing for us to realize because we see throughout the book of Nehemiah, the rest of the book, that Nehemiah was a man of action. Uh, we can see clearly over and over again how he is not one for just waiting around. And so the very fact that here in this instant, 
his action was to stop and pray and to fast, that should tell us something about how we should approach some big decisions uh, that maybe we may face in our own life. Um, how often do we treat prayer either like the last desperate choice or as a screen for hiding our inaction? And what I mean by that is that how often is it that prayer is not the first place we turn, but it is the last place that we look? Something happens in our lives, some tragic event, some um, big decision, and it's not our nature normally to go first to prayer. If that is yours, praise the Lord. But for many of us, we tend to maybe look to ourselves first. How can I fix this situation? What can be done here? And sometimes it's not until the bitter end. It's the last desperate act that we turn to prayer that, well, nothing else has worked, so I need to stop and pray. But sometimes we use prayer as a screen for inaction, right? Sometimes we step back and we go, well, I just need to pray about that, right? Um, children's director, Ms. Sherry, comes to you and says, I need you to help lead games for VBS. And you say, well, I need to pray about that. Now, what you really mean is this is awkward and I need you to go away and hopefully you'll forget about asking about this again. And that's what we say. I need to pray about it is our way of saying, I'm not going to ever take any action. And yet Nehemiah doesn't, he doesn't fall for either one of these extremes, if you will. He stops immediately, primarily, and praise and fast. But he does it in a way that he is still driving towards action. So his prayers are not something that he's throwing up to just put off doing something. They're to help guide and direct what it is exactly that he needs to do. And so we see very clearly that Nehemiah is praying and fasting in order to take action. So he stops first and prays, but all of those prayers are focused on what action God would have him to take in response to this thing that has so broken his heart. So, but he doesn't only pray. He also fasts. Now, fasting is something that is probably or maybe not as common for all of us as praying. Praying is something that's it's pretty, pretty basic. We all learn how to pray uh, as a child, as soon as we become a believer, we've heard people pray all the time in services and in Bible studies. We understand the concept of praying as a conversation with our Father, that we stop, we speak to Him, we listen to Him through the Spirit, we are seeking His guidance, His direction, His insight. But fasting is different. Um, fasting is, I guess, more of an advanced Christian skill, if you will. Uh, and, and part of that is just the nature of the fact that I believe there has to be a certain level of spiritual maturity before you can enter into fasting. And then the other part is fasting, we're told over and over again in Scripture, is not something that we're to do publicly. It's something that we're to do privately. And so it's not something that we see, you know, in a service somebody doing it's it's it, it doesn't have that observable aspect you know it's not at the beginning of um a bible study somebody says well i'm going to fast now well we don't normally eat during bible studies anyway um unless it's wednesday in the word and we're still eating uh, but it's just not something that we observe uh, and so it's something that we don't often understand quite as much so let's talk about fasting for a second so biblical fasting has been the practice or is the practice of abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. If you're used to a routine three square meals a day, going without food for a spiritual practice may sound strange, but fasting is a very common practice um, that we see throughout scripture. So fasting is not just going without food, right? This is not a diet. Uh, this is not about calories or, or losing weight or any of those kind of things. So we hear things like the Daniel fast. Those are really more uh, about nutrition and those kind of aspects where fasting, biblically speaking, is when we, we go without eating so that our spiritual life is heightened. And so we do without food 
so that the hunger, the physical hunger that we feel reminds us of the spiritual hunger that we need to strive for. And when you're fasting and during the day you get hungry, that is a physical reminder that I need to stop and pray about what I'm doing. So the fasting itself is really just a mechanism to drive deeper our prayer life and our intimacy with God. We do without as a way of saying, look, I'm going to separate all, all these other distractions and I'm going to allow this, this process that is natural to my body. Eating is something that we have to do, right? Fasting is always just a temporary thing. If we stop eating, we die. And so it's not about something that we do forever. It's for a period of time. And you're saying, I'm going to put off this very natural function so that it can have a greater supernatural effect. And so we stop eating and there are lots of different kinds of fast. Um, you can fast just during daylight hours. Uh, you can fast for a stretch of time and just only um, fasting from solid food. You're just drinking like water and juice. Um, there are lots of different kinds of fast. Now, biblically speaking, fasting from food is the only kind of fast that we talk about. Now, in our modern age, sometimes we hear about fasting from media or fasting from our phones or fasting from Facebook or whatever these other distractions in our life might be. And those are good, but they are a derivative of biblical fasting. We don't see those anywhere else biblically. And so from a biblical standpoint, fasting is going without food. Now, there are some situations where people have medical concerns. Uh, and so you've heard from your doctor that it's just not a good thing for you to fast. You, you don't need to go without food or you don't need to go without all food. And so in those circumstances, I think that's the time that it's okay for us to say, okay, well, I'm going to go without something else in order to heighten my spiritual activity. Problem is there's nothing else that's as good as food because there's nothing else that's as natural to us that we can stop doing that reminds us constantly throughout the day, I'm hungry, I need to be praying. Um, fasting from media, from Facebook, from your phone, that might be a really healthy spiritual habit but it may not be as good of a reminder to you to be focused spiritually on whatever it is that you're praying about. And most often, biblically speaking, when we see somebody talking about fasting, it is for a specific purpose. And so there's something in their life that they are trying to hear from the Lord about, a decision they're trying to make, um, something uh, of, it's not just a normal routine thing. There's something specific that they're doing. And so in that moment, they choose to fast in order to have a breakthrough in that one particular area. In his book, John Piper, uh, he wrote a book called Hunger for God that's a great book on fasting. And he said, Christian fasting at its root is the hunger of a homesickness for God. Christian fasting is not only the spontaneous, not only has the spontaneous effect of superior satisfaction in God, it is also a chosen weapon against every force in the world that would take that satisfaction away. Christian fasting is not only the spontaneous effect of superior satisfaction in God, it is also a weapon against every force that would take that satisfaction away. What's he saying? He's saying that fasting is an opportunity for us to remember that there is nothing else in life that sustains us like God. And our ultimate satisfaction needs to come from and only from him. Listen, I'm a foodie. I love to eat. I love all kinds of food. I get great joy and satisfaction from food, trying different foods, eating food with different people. But yet that satisfaction pales in comparison to some satisfaction of an intimate communion with my holy God. And that's what fasting is about. And then it is a weapon that would be against any force in the world that tries to take that satisfaction away. So it's an opportunity for us to, to narrow the focus of our lives on to God. So if you have never tried fasting, um, it is private, it is personal, and 
it should be something that you research and possibly even talk to your doctor about. If you're, if you've got uh, health concerns, it, it's probably something that you need to talk to them about as well. But it's definitely something that you need to pray about uh, and research so that you understand biblically what this is and what the purpose of it is. But I would suggest that the next time that you have a major spiritual event in your life, a major crisis in your life, a major decision, that you think about fasting for that. Fasting and focusing your prayer in on whatever that need or aspect of your life right then is. In our fast-paced culture, sometimes we need an outside jolt like the absence of food in order to help bring our focus in on that. And so I would challenge you uh, to think about that the next time that you're in one of those moments to think about fasting and how that might uh, heighten your prayer life. And that's exactly what we see Nehemiah doing here. Another thing that we see Nehemiah doing is that he stopped and he fasted and he prayed and he wept. In our fast-paced, action-packed culture, sometimes we need to stop and weep and mourn and fast these things that must these are things that absolutely must take their time we are all about rushing everything in our society and sometimes things like weeping and mourning are things that don't need to be rushed we need to take time to weep over the loss of a loved one or the loss of a relationship or the loss of a career we can't find ourselves trapped in those, but we do need to take adequate time to work through those. These are things that they just can't be rushed, but we need to realize also that they are not in action. We are trusting the more ultimate action taker, which is God, when we step back and we, we pull back to take the time to weep and mourn over things in our life. Application question for you. What is something in your life right now or upcoming that you need to stop and fast and pray over? Is there a decision in your life, in the life of a child, uh, in the life of a loved one? Is there a, a critical sin that you are trying to overcome? A breakthrough that you're trying to have? Is there one of those moments coming up? Are you in it right now? where you need to take some time to fast and pray and maybe even mourn and weep over the change that's happening in that situation in your life. Let me encourage you to, to make sure that you take the time to do that. Moving on into verse five, it says, and I said, and this is Nehemiah, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenants and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. First thing I want us to see here is this phrase, O Lord God of heaven. It's a phrase that is unique to the captivity books, the post-captivity books. Um, and the post-captivity books are the ones that are written after Babylon comes in and takes over. And so that's going to be Ezra, Nehemiah, and Daniel. It's unique just to those three books. And we have to remember that after the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, God can no longer be designated as the one who dwells between the cherubim, which is, these, there are many designations in the Old Testament of God that center around the ark or the temple or the city of Jerusalem. And yet now, because of this destruction in this post-captivity books, they've got to kind of rethink that. So remember that from the Exodus in 1446 BC until the fall of the temple, God's presence has been literally in above the Ark of the Covenant. There are on... The Ark of the Covenant, uh, biblically, the description tells us that on the lid of this box, um, there were two angels that had their wings spread towards each other. 
and this was called the seed of God. And it was quite literally the presence of God among the people. Uh, that's why it stayed in the Holy of Holies. Again, we've talked uh, in some of our sermons about the structure of the temple, uh, which followed the structure of the tabernacle, which was really this kind of concentric boxes, smaller and smaller boxes. And in the very smallest, most intimate place, it was called the Holy of Holies. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. That's where the presence of God was. And that was a very literal thing for God's people. And they took it very seriously. Uh, we've heard the stories about how when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, they would tie something around his ankle because if he got in before the presence of the Lord and his heart wasn't right, he would just die from the very holiness of God that was there in that room and they'd have to drag him out. So this, this, was, this was something that was serious and literal for God's people. And yet now, all of a sudden, all of that, the temple is destroyed, the, the ark is gone, and God's people are having to wrestle with where is God for us? Where, where is he at? They didn't yet have the Holy Spirit who was dwelling inside of them like we have. So when Jerusalem fell, they had to refer to God in a higher form and this phrase that is used here in these three books, O Lord God of heaven, reminds them that his presence is not absent. It is in a greater form. He is, he's in heaven over all of his creation, not just there in this one place among his people. We contrast that to the New Testament when we have the Holy Spirit indwelling each one of us. So God's presence is never further away than a whispered prayer. His presence can't be altered by any outside force. We choose at times to squelch the voice of the Holy Spirit, but it can never be removed. When we become a Christian, the Bible tells us that the third person of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, is bestowed upon each one of us. That is God's presence indwelling inside of us. We become the Holy of Holies. We become the seed of God on top of the ark. And nothing can separate us from that because His presence is no longer tied to an artifact or a place or a people. It is inside of each one of his children. And we should appreciate that. That there is nothing that we can do that can separate us from the Holy Spirit. Because there is nothing that we can do to lose our salvation. We understand that our salvation was bought through the blood of Christ. Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. There, that, and nothing else. Nothing that we did. And so we understand from that 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 means that there's also nothing that we can do to lose our salvation. We can never be bad enough, evil enough, sinful enough to lose our salvation once we have it. And so the Holy Spirit, once indwelled in us, is never going anywhere. Now we can squelch the voice of the Spirit. What that means is that we put earmuffs on. Uh, so that we can no longer hear him. My kids are into video games. Um, they love playing video games and they like playing video games where they're playing with other people, their other friends that are you know, not there, they're in their home somewhere, it's all online. And so they have these big headphones that they put on these microphones so that they can hear what's going on and they can talk to their friends about, oh, I'm over here on this side of the map and um, that kind of thing. But those headphones squelch out Everything else is happening around them, right? And so I can walk into the living room and say, Christopher, I need you to take out the garbage. And he never hears that. Even though I'm as close to him as I could reach out and touch him. But he doesn't hear it because he's muffled the sound of my voice and he's amplified other voices in his ears. And so he can no longer hear it. And that's exactly what we can do to the Holy Spirit. Even though he lives inside of us and we can never be separated from him, we can put our headphones on so that we muffle his voice 
right? Our sin, our indifference to church, to scripture, those things dull the knife that he uses to cut into our spirit. They muffle his voice. And then we can begin to look to other things like self-help and our career and TV psychologists. And we look to those things and we turn up those voices in our ears. And all of a sudden, even though the Holy Spirit is there, present with us, and he's trying to speak to us, to guide us in the ways of truth and righteousness, we've diminished his voice and we've turned up the voices around us so much that we can't hear him anymore. And so we have to ask ourselves tough questions. Application questions like, what does it mean to you that the Holy Spirit indwells inside of you all the time? And what are you doing on any given day to either hone your ears to his voice or muffle your ears to his voice? Because we can choose to do either. As we come to the end of our time, we're going to cut off right here uh, just a couple minutes early because next week we are going to look at the structure of the prayer of Nehemiah. And we're going to talk about how there are four aspects, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. And it makes a great model for our prayers as well. And so we're going to dive into those and we're really going to talk about how our prayer life can reflect his prayer given to us here in chapter one. So make sure you're back here with us next week. Uh, we'll be live back in the fellowship hall. Uh, I'll be back and we'll be diving further into chapter one and looking at this powerful prayer and how we can use it to sharpen our own prayer lives. Pray with me. Father God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for teaching us and reminding us about the importance of our prayers Father, may be heightened by fasting, guided by your Holy Spirit that dwells in us. So Father, this week as we go out, help us to listen keenly to your Holy Spirit and allow it to direct our prayer lives. Father, may we find moments to stop and to pray. Father, may we examine our lives and if there are hurdles coming up in our life that we really need to focus in on, we really need to hear your voice on. Father, help us to 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 amp up your voice through fasting and focused prayer. God, we pray that you never let us forget that you are never farther away than a quiet, whispered prayer. And God, we thank you for that. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.